Hi, and welcome to our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. We need to talk. You've done something wrong. Okay. I'm toast. No, I'm not upset. I'm upset. I'm just kind of surprised. I'm a ticking time bomb of volcanic fury. Because you forgot about yesterday? Because you are a moron of epic proportions. Yesterday, yesterday. I'm toast. Yesterday was the 15th anniversary of our first official date. Oh, that's right, I remember. I have no memory of that. Do I need to get some flowers or something? No. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. No. Are you mad? No. Yes. You'll remember next year. I will. I won't. So how do you like the casserole? It's, uh, it, it's a new flavor. It tastes like the devil ate a skunk sandwich and vomited into my mouth. That's my mom's favorite recipe. I grew up on that. Might as well slap my mother in the face. Well, you know I would never do that. You know I think your mother's wonderful. Actually, I think your mother's a... So... Wanna have sex? How was your day? Wanna have sex? Exhausting. Don't even think about it, you sex maniac. Exhausting, huh? Wanna have sex? Exhausting. I'd rather rub broken glass in my eyes. Do you want to cuddle? Want to cuddle for two seconds, then have sex? My head hurts. You lay one finger on me and I'll beat you with this lamp, you filthy McNasty. Okay. Good night. How about now? You want to have sex now? Hey, thanks for joining us tonight as we continue in our series, Family Life. I hope you've enjoyed this series. It's been all about the family and how the different elements of a family come to play and the struggles and the difficulties that we all face. Without a doubt, one of the single greatest issues that families face is communication. Communication is an essential to have any healthy, happy family. And so tonight, that's what we're going to take a look at. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this evening, for this time that we have gathered together. May you bless our study into your word, and Holy Spirit, teach us through your power and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's get right into it. <clears throat> In order to understand the key to a happy family through communication, we need to understand, first of all, how to break down communication. Communication breaks down very quickly, and if any of you are part of a family, you've experienced this. There are none of us that have not gone through this experience, whether it be in a family or at work or with friends or in a church even, it happens. But communication can break down very quickly. I developed this uh, lesson, this understanding, years ago as I was putting together materials for young couples as they were preparing to get married, or even couples who were married. We wanted to understand how communication was the key to their relationship with one another. And so I developed this and wanted us to truly understand some of these elements about how communication, first of all, breaks down. When you understand how communication breaks down, you can somehow stem the tide in the process and you can go, wait a minute, I see what's happening here. Our communication is beginning to break down and I see the signs of it. When you begin to learn that and you get to that point, you can step forward a little more effectively in restoring that balance in communication. But let's just take a look. I wanna give you an example uh, that's found in the Word of God in the nation of Israel when they first entered into the promised land. Now on the screen there you can see, and you can't see everything, but you can see primarily uh, the tribes of Israel, how they were separated by the Jordan River. One of the things that I want to focus on are the three tribes there on the right hand side of your screen, or yes, in the right hand side of your screen, uh, Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. 
uh, for some reason, instead of them all staying on this side, the, the western side of the Jordan River, they went over to the eastern side. And these three tribes, well, actually half the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Gad, and the tribe of Rudin, decided to have that natural barrier between them, and they took a land that was to the east of the Jordan River. So as we look at this, we see them settling there. Everybody's beginning to settle in the land. And an unusual circumstance took place. <clears throat> the three tribes on the east side, Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, they decided to build this ginan just a huge altar. I almost said ginormous. There is no such thing as ginormous. But it was a gigantic altar. An altar like they had uh, at the tabernacle. You know the tabernacle, the tent that was carried around, they had an altar? Well, they built a mock-up of that, and it was huge. I mean, just a huge altar. I think I got a picture here of something it might have looked like. It wasn't a simple little one. This one was exaggerated. It was so big that the people on the other side of the Jordan, which, by the way, is not that small a river, the people on the other side of the river of Jordan, when they looked across, they could actually see this huge altar that had been built. Well, <clears throat> the first thing that happens in a breakdown of communication is we begin to judge too quickly. We see something, we formulate an opinion about it. Uh, we hear something, we formulate an opinion about it, and we have a tendency to judge too quickly. Uh, I've often been accused of, of the opposite of that. I, I have a tendency to believe the best in people and not the worst in people. But the harsh reality is that the majority of people think the worst of people instead of the best. And we have a tendency, just as human beings, to jump in and judge too quickly <clears throat> in any given circumstance. And that's exactly what happened here and as the story unfolds in Joshua chapter 22. When the tribes of Reuben and Gad and East Manasseh arrived on Gelioth, still on the west side of the Jordan, they built a large, impressive altar there by the river. The rest of the people of Israel were told, Listen, the people of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and East Manasseh have built an altar at Gileath on our side of the Jordan. And they thought, well, what are they doing there? They built this huge altar there, and they said, what are you doing? <clears throat> they jumped to the conclusion that these people were abandoning their faith in God, and they were going to go off and follow whatever gods may have been in the land that they were in. And so they built this huge altar there that they could see from their side. And as they built it, the people over here in the other tribes on the western side of the Jordan River, they got all in arms. They jumped to the conclusion that this is terrible. This is horrible. What are they doing? They didn't think the good in them. They thought bad in them. Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus was teaching us. He said, do not judge others so that God will not judge you. In the same way, you judge others. And he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. So why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? How dare you say to your brother, please let me take that speck out of your eye when you have a log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, we have a tendency to just jump and judge just as quickly as can be. But that scripture there, and Jesus said, Do not judge others so that God will not judge you. Very simple. We don't need to be judging anyone. So how does communication break down? When we jump to conclusions, we judge too quickly. Here's the second thing that happens. We get defensive. <clears throat> Let me share with you something. When you get defensive, you lose. You lose. Defensive attitudes and spirit and heart do not promote good communication. 
Uh, we see that in politics, we see it in our country, we see it in families, in churches, in all different aspects of life. Defensive attitudes do not promote good communication. <clears throat> so for what do we do? We first of all judge too quickly. Secondly, we get defensive. That's exactly what happened with Israel. When the people of Israel heard this, the whole community came together at Shiloh to go to war against their brothers on the other side of the river. They came together to go to war. They were that quick, that defensive. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 7, the scripture says this, Someone with a quick temper does foolish things, but someone with understanding remains calm. And you know what? When you get just a handful of people who are upset and they get in a crowd, that crowd begins to take on the personality of those handful who are upset. It's called a mob mentality. And that is exactly what was taking place here. Someone had judged too quickly. They came to their conclusion, which was wrong, by the way. But they came to this conclusion. Then they got defensive and angry and they did not remain calm they started to do something very foolish. In James chapter 1, the half-brother of Jesus, James, said this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. You need to say that. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. You and I need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. We need to be careful about getting defensive and angry <clears throat> because when you're angry, you'll make the greatest speech that you ever regret. <laughs> so here we got these three things. We judge too quickly, we get defensive, and then we abuse others with our words. When we begin to abuse others with our words, it becomes a, a nightmare in a relationship. A nightmare among friends, a nightmare among uh, a married couple, a nightmare in the family, a nightmare in the church when we begin to abuse others with our words. When I was growing up, we used to have this little rhyme that we said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, dear friends, that is a lie. Words cut to the very quick of the heart. Uh, you can get over you know, a little smack on your hand or falling down. You can get over the bumps and bruises of life, but often people do not get over the words that were spoken to them. We abuse others with our words. Here in this passage in Joshua chapter 22, uh, all of the Lord's congregation is asking, what is this? And here's the key, faithless act you have committed against the God of Israel. See, they thought that they were, this was a faithless act. They had jumped to the conclusion that they were abandoning their faith in God and going off and following the gods of the lands wherever they were living right now. And that, of course, was not true, but nonetheless, they judged too quickly, they got defensive, and now abusive words have begun to be thrown. Today, you have turned away from following the Lord by building an altar for yourselves. Today, you have rebelled against the Lord. Well, that was not the case. Not the case at all. James talks about this mentality of abusing others with our words. He says this, A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrong-placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. And then he gets really upset. And then he says this, this is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God our Father. With the same tongues, we curse the very men and women He made in His image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. He talks about that. 
We need to stop judging too quickly. We need to stop getting defensive and angry. And we need to never abuse others with our words. God doesn't want us to do that. That destroys all communication. So the question now becomes, how do we restore communication? How do we restore it? Well, there's a three-step guideline that I'm going to give you here first. How do we restore communication? Well, let's look at the nation of Israel and how this situation resolved. First of all, prayer. You need to pray. The way that you begin to restore communication is through prayer. In Joshua chapter 22, verses 22 and 23, the people of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, they, they replied back, they said, The Lord, the Mighty One, is God. The Lord, the Mighty One, is God. They repeated it so they understood completely. He knows the truth, and may Israel know it too. We have not built the altar in treacherous rebellion against the Lord. If we have done so, do not spare our lives this day. We have built an altar for ourselves to turn we if, if we have built an altar to turn ourselves away from the Lord or to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings, may the Lord himself punish us. They openly said, "May the Lord deal with this." James again, the person we go to in this. By the way, I like the book of James, especially for new believers, because James gives practical, practical advice to those who need it most. And when you're first starting out in your Christian faith, the book of James puts your faith where the rubber meets the road. He's very plain spoken, he's very clear, and he gives a direction. Now here in James chapter 1, it says, When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they came to test your faith and to produce in you a quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed, and you will find that you have become men of mature character with the right sort of independence. Very important statement to look at there. The right sort of independence. He goes on to say, and if in the process any of you does not know how to meet any particular problems he has, only to ask God. And God will give them generously to all men without making them feel foolish or guilty, and he may be quite sure that the necessary wisdom will be given him. The first step in restoring communication is to ask God about this circumstance, to ask God about this situation. Seek His wisdom. Seek His guidance. He will give it. That's what the people there said. Let's talk to God about this. Let's ask Him if I'm doing something wrong or if I'm not doing something wrong. Let's talk to Him about it and let God reveal what's happening next. So the first step in restoring communication, pray. Here's the second step. Listen. <laughs> you know how we jump to conclusions? Sometimes we jump to conclusions because we do not listen carefully. We need to listen. In Joshua 22, the people went on and said, The truth is, we have built this altar because we fear that in the future your descendants will say to ours, What right do you have to worship the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord has placed the Jordan River as a barrier between our people and you people of Reuben and Gad. You have no claim to the Lord. So your descendants may prevent our descendants from worshiping the Lord. They had thought that if they didn't maintain some type of visual tie to say, hey, they're a part of our family over there on that side too. So they put that up so that both sides would be reminded that, hey, we're family. We're part of it. We all worship the Lord our God. That was the reason they built it, but that was a totally erroneous conclusion that Israel came up with, the tribes on the west side of the Jordan River. But all the east side wanted was for them to remember that, hey, we're a part of you, and we worship the Lord God too. Well, <clears throat> you've got to listen to what people are saying. 
Sometimes we see the actions of others or we hear the words of others, but we don't really know exactly what it is that they're trying to say, what they're trying to communicate, until we begin to listen. Just listen carefully. So, first of all, pray about it. Second, take the time to listen to what the other person has to say. And then here's a third thing. Oh, wait a minute. Let me continue this verse. So we decided to build the altar not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but as a memorial. It will remind our descendants and your descendants that we too have a right to worship the Lord and His sanctuary. The Bible goes on there in Job 18 to say, if you stopped to listen, we could talk to you. Isn't that a great statement? That's one we need to put up on the refrigerator. If you stop to listen, we could talk to you. In Proverbs 19 and verse 20, the scripture says, If you listen to advice and are willing to learn, one day you will be wise. Another great verse. So pray, listen. Here's the third thing. Understand. Understand. You may not be in complete agreement with what has been communicated, but you need to understand it. And when you understand it, then you can begin the process of restoring communication to understand something. The Bible says that when Phineas, the priest, and the high officials heard this from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they were very happy. Phineas replied to them, Today we know that the Lord is among us because you have not sinned against the Lord as we thought. Instead, you have saved us from destruction. Then Phineas and the ten ambassadors went back to the people of Israel and told them what had happened. And all Israel, all Israel rejoiced and praised God and spoke no more of war against Reuben and Gad. And let me tell you something here, this, and this has been very frustrating to me to watch over the years. A lot of people that are having difficulties and, and circumstances and in marital conflict, and I've counseled with many, and many of the pastors at our church have counseled with others, and here's a sad scenario we see when that deterioration in communication has transpired and you talk to them about restoring it, when we pray and then we listen and they realized that they were wrong on one part or the other, and we reach that point of understanding, uh, they dig their heels in and sometimes do not want to do what happened here. They do not rejoice and say, I'm so glad I was wrong. Their pride always steps in and says, well, I may have been wrong about this, but... I was right about other things, you know, and so they dig in and they don't want to admit that they were wrong. They want to admit that what they thought was bad was really something good. They don't want to accept the responsibility for their behavior and their actions, and they never fully heal. They never fully heal from it because they don't do what these people did here in this circumstance. The scripture says they rejoice that they were wrong. How many times have you rejoiced that you were wrong about someone? How many times have you rejoiced because you were wrong in what you heard or what you thought about a situation, circumstance, or a person? How many times have you rejoiced that you were wrong? And you see, that's where the healing really becomes real in your life and in mine, when we can rejoice over those things. So what I want to do, just in the last few minutes that I have, I want to give you some solid biblical guidelines for communication. Are you ready? These are all found in Ephesians chapter 4. And you can take your Bible out sometime and you can begin reading these. They start in verse 26 and go down through verse 32. But I want you to look at these verses, 26 to 32. And I want you to follow with me in some of these simple biblical guidelines for communication. Number one. Don't carry over anger. We all get angry. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, be angry, but don't sin. <laughs> okay? We can be angry. Angry is, an, is, is a natural emotion that we all have. It's part of the way God made us. But we don't need to carry over anger. When you carry over anger, it becomes bitterness. 
here in Ephesians, I mean, uh, yeah, in Ephesians chapter 4, the scripture says, if you're angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Get over it quickly. Don't carry a grudge. Don't carry over your anger. If you do, it'll become bitterness, and bitterness is a horrible experience to go through. So number one, don't carry over anger. Number two, recognize Satan's strategies. Let me tell you why carrying over anger and getting angry is a bad idea. Because the scripture tells us here in verse 27, for when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil. You say, what's a foothold? Well, did you ever open a door and it started closing on you and you stuck your foot in the door so that you could keep it open? Well, that's kind of like a foothold. Only in this sense, it doesn't say just a foothold. It's a mighty foothold. And when you're angry and you're nursing that anger and you're just pushing it and pushing it for all it's worth, you have given the devil a mighty foothold. That's his strategy. You see, he loves it when we're angry because when we're angry, now we're subject to his realm and now we can delve into the aspects of bitterness that will ruin your life and the lives of those around you. So number one, don't carry over any anger. Number two, recognize Satan's strategies that he uses anger against us. Number three, Repent when needed. There are times when you and I need to repent of the anger that we have carried. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.28, If anyone is stealing, he must stop it and begin using those hands of his for honest work so he can give to others in need. So if you're living in sin, stop it. Good guideline for biblical communication. Repent. Repent of things in your life you know that have contributed to the destruction of the relationships that you have. And so, don't carry over anger. Recognize Satan's strategies. Repent when needed. And then here's a big one. Strive for words that build up. You know you need to speak good into people's lives, not bad. Speak victory into their lives, not defeat. So strive for words that build up. That's what he says here. In Ephesians 4.29, it says this, Don't use bad language. Boy, mom and dad, you might need to put that on your refrigerator too. Don't use bad language. Say only what is good and helpful to those you are talking to and what will give them a blessing. Speak words that are give a blessing to someone. Tell them how good they did in life. Don't use bad language. And then lastly, this, and it's the same aspect of principles that we have throughout many aspects of communication. Um, recognize God's presence. Uh, you've got to recognize that God is a part of every aspect of your life, and especially in communication. Don't cause the Holy Spirit sorrow by the way you live. Remember, he is the one who marks you to be present on that day when salvation from sin will be complete. When you finally enter the gates of heaven, it's the Holy Spirit that is going to be rejoicing greatly because He is the one who has marked you. He is the one who is in your spirit, in your heart, in your life. He is the one who will be with you as you enter into those gates, whether it be through death or the rapture of the church. But I want you to recognize his presence. Recognize that God is in you whenever you're in a situation where communication is necessary. Don't carry over anger. Recognize Satan has a strategy to use that anger against you. Repent if you need to over anything in your life that may be destroying your ability to communicate effectively. Strive for words that build up. Don't tear other people down. Build them up. Encourage them. My mama used to say, if you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. But we need to strive for words that build other people up. Then recognize God's presence. He is with you at all times. And finally, be forgiving. You and I need to have a forgiving attitude. And James concludes these elements, these guidelines in communication by focusing on that. 
He says, stop being mean, bad-tempered, angry, quarreling, harsh words, and a dislike of others, because they should have no place in your lives. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you, because you belong to Christ. Thank you for joining us tonight as we look at these lessons on family life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for blessing us and encouraging us. We thank you for the guidelines that you give us in your holy word to help us not just with communication, but with nearly every aspect of our lives. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us and in us to guide and direct us. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the hope of heaven and the wonderful forgiveness so that we can one day stand before you and be a part of that great crowd in heaven, celebrating and shouting the victories of Jesus. Dear friend, you may be uh, listening to this, watching. You don't know for certain if you died that you'd get to heaven, but you'd like to know. Would you take a moment just to pray with me, just a special prayer to invite Jesus into your life? Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to be able to go to heaven when I die. So I place my faith in you. I believe that you died on the cross for me and shed your precious blood to forgive my sin. And I believe that when you died, they took you down and laid you in a tomb. And three days later, you wondrously rose from the dead. And if you have the power to do that, you certainly have the power to give me a home in heaven with you. So, Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life? Will you be my Savior and forgive me of all my sin? Will you be my Lord to give me guidance and leadership in the areas that I need it most? And will you be my friend to walk with me and help me and advise me that I might be able to be all that you want me to be and one day I can be in heaven with you? And so, dear friend, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, the scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hey, let somebody know. If you don't have anybody you can tell that you just prayed to receive Christ, just drop me a note at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us tonight. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch over you, no matter where you may go. And until we come together again, keep looking up. God bless. Take care.